The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the Court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Justice Breyer pretty clearly is uh, in the moderate wing of the current Supreme Court. It's fair to say that over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, there is not much left of a, uh, an extremely liberal wing, and I think those who are considered to be liberals these days are pretty much moderate justices. Uh, that would include Justice Ginsburg, except perhaps in sex discrimination cases, Justice Souter, who's now left the court uh, pretty clearly as well, Justice Breyer, and even Justice Stevens, uh, very much a uh, moderate in those situations. I have a couple of things to say, though, about two very important Supreme Court decisions in which Justice Breyer played uh, different roles. One was the 19, one is the 1995 decision uh, in the United States versus Lopez, the Supreme Court decision dealing with congressional power under the Commerce Clause, in which the Supreme Court, uh, five to four, broke with almost 60 years uh, of practice, and in this case struck down the possession, a uh, federal statute prohibiting possession of guns within a thousand feet of uh, schools. Justice Breyer dissented uh, for, for himself and three others and wrote a rather eloquent and, in my mind, very persuasive dissenting opinion, in which, among other things, he uh, criticized the majority for, indeed, departing without any real justification from these uh, almost 60 years of precedence. And he also attached, uh, this made his law clerks work very, very hard, a very lengthy appendix showing the relationship between violence uh, on uh, or in or around schools and uh, commerce. So that I appreciated, uh, appreciate and admire uh, quite a good deal. In addition, Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and I have filed a dissent. In our view, this statute falls well within the scope of the Constitution's commerce power. In reaching this conclusion, we apply three well-established legal principles. First, Congress can regulate acts within a single state that significantly affect commerce among the states. Second, in deciding whether that is so, the court must consider not a single instance, say of a single gun in a school, but the cumulative effects of many similar instances of all guns that are in or near schools. Third, the court must also give Congress considerable leeway. That is to say, the court must ask not whether there is, in fact, a significant Commerce Clause connection, but only whether Congress could rationally believe so. Applying these standards, it seems clear to us that Congress could believe that guns in schools amount to a commercial as well as a human problem. A host of government reports, hearings, and studies set forth facts that show, one, that guns in schools is a serious problem. One study, for example, says that 6% of inner city children carry guns to school, that 12% have been shot at, and up to 20% have been threatened. Two, that school violence significantly impairs learning. Three, that learning, reading, writing, arithmetic has long accounted for much of our nation's economic growth, and today and in the future, in a world of high technology and global economic competition, the differences between classrooms that teach and those that do not may well spell the difference between high-paying jobs and unemployment, between firms locating in a community or staying away, in a word, between prosperity and poverty. At the least, Congress could have come to such a conclusion. It could have found guns in schools antithetical to a well-educated workforce, 
and it could reasonably have believed that an educated workforce in today's world gives a community the kind of advantage comparable to that given by location near a railhead or harbor in the past. This court has long recognized, to quote Justice Holmes, that commerce is a practical, not a technical legal conception. It also has long proved willing to apply pre-existing Commerce Clause law to changing economic circumstance. That being so, the reasonableness of Congress's factual beliefs should have proved sufficient basis for finding the connection with interstate commerce that the Constitution requires and holding the Gun-Free School Zones Act constitutional. Such a holding would be consistent with, if not dictated by, this Court's prior precedent. For these and other reasons, we dissent. On the other hand, I do have some problems with Justice Breyer's concurring opinion uh, in the Van Orden case. This was a case that upheld the display of a Ten Commandments monument on public property in Austin. Uh, and it was in marked contrast to his joining the majority in the Companion McCreary case, which struck down the display of the Ten Commandments in a county courthouse. Justice Breyer in this Van Orden case was quite pragmatic. He emphasized the 40 years in which this the monument had been there, both there, in fact, and around the country, that there had been few objections. Pretty clear he was very reluctant to uproot uh, Ten Commandments monuments around the country, uh, with the attendant headlines being, Supreme Court strikes down Ten Commandments, or something of that sort. Uh, so his pragmatic impulses, which ordinarily I admire very much, I think, with respect, led him in the wrong direction uh, in the Van Orden case. And one final thought, uh, Justice Breyer is uh, very clearly not an ideologue. He is a moderate, as I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, he is a pragmatist, and that word pragmatist is not pejorative. One of our finest justices, Justice Jackson, was a pragmatist as well. Justice Breyer has an opinion to announce. I'm announcing the opinion in Zadvidas, the Underdown, and Ashcroft, the Ma. The case focuses upon aliens whom a court has ordered removed from the United States, say because they have committed crimes or otherwise violated the law. The statutes say that such an alien is supposed to be removed, i.e. sent to another country, within 90 days of the removal order becoming final. But suppose the Attorney General cannot bring about the alien's removal within those 90 days. A special provision of the statute provides that in such a case, certain aliens, including those uh, who the Attorney General determines may run away, or pose a danger to the community, quote, may be detained beyond the removal period, end quote. But the statute doesn't say how long beyond the removal period they may be detained. Forever? The case before us involves aliens whom no other country will take, at least not so far. Uh, and uh, we hold, in interpreting the provision, as applied to those aliens who are in confinement, that the statute does not permit the Attorney General to keep them in custody indefinitely, but rather it implicitly limits custody to a period reasonably necessary to bring about the alien's removal. We fear that any other interpretation, say an interpretation authorizing indefinite confinement, would raise a serious constitutional problem relating to deprivation of liberty, say, under the 14th Amendment or Fifth Amendment. And we believe that Congress would have preferred an interpretation of the statute that assured a statute that is constitutional to an interpretation that, because potentially unconstitutional, would mean a serious risk of no statute at all. In 2007, Justice Breyer 
dissented from the bench in what is one of his most well-known dissents, although not his first dissent from the bench. Uh, in the case of parents involved, this was the school desegregation case from Seattle and Louisville in which the court held that the uh, practice of assigning children to schools in part uh, uh, in an attempt to achieve racial balance was unconstitutional. Justice Breyer dissented, and he has a really eloquent dissent, both uh, verbally and uh, in, in his written dissent, about the meaning of Brown versus Board of Education and the meaning of democracy and the importance in our society, in our country, of people being able to work together to understand each other um, and to, to reach across all kinds of different barriers. Uh, and I think that the justice believed, uh, as he said, in, the, in, that, uh, in the importance of public schools uh, in helping to promote that very important aspect of our democracy.